So good morning, everybody, and welcome to our final workshop for 2022. Uh, it's quite hard to believe we are here at the end of uh, the year already. It's been an absolute pleasure bringing this series to you. If you have missed any of our uh, workshops to date and you're having trouble, um, I know that um, Alison pops the details in the chat box, but I'm not sure if those people at home can see those. So reach out to the Postgraduate Association um, if for some reason you do want to access something that you can't. Is there a generic email, um, Alison, that I could read out? I just noticed when I read, listened back to the recording, they can't see the chat box. Is there a generic email that might be helpful if people need to um, contact for access issues? Can you hear me, Alison? Oh. Okay, so um, I'm Alison from the Southern Cross Postgraduate Association and students can contact me anytime on my email is skills, S-A-I-L-L-S at scpa.net.au and uh, if you want to find out where we're posting um, our recordings or any query from students are welcome we're happy to help out so thanks yeah thank you Alison so as I said this um, series is brought to you by the postgraduate association that are here to help you with your postgraduate study so please 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 reach out to them um, for anything um, related to your postgraduate study that they may um, be able to help you with. We've just got someone else popping into the room, so that's fabulous. And before we kick off, I'd just like to do a welcome to country. So I acknowledge and pay my deepest respect to the ancestors, elders and descendants of the land upon which we meet and study. I am mindful that within and without the buildings, these lands always were and always will be Aboriginal land. Ah, now I've just put that up on the screen. Hopefully people can see that um, at home. Um, I'll just hold it there for two seconds so if anybody needs to. So perhaps before we kick off, I would love to just, um, if, if anybody would like to write into the chat box, what makes you most anxious or, or um, what motivated you to come along um, today uh, in terms of interviews? What it, so that I can just speak to those points. Um, invariably, there'll be things that, um, uh, that, cause anxiety for others. I don't know uh, too many people that can glide through the interview process without any form of anxiety. Um, so what, what brought you here today? We're, we're delighted to have you live because um, these sessions, uh, I will deliver the content, but I also like to keep it um, pretty informal so that if you have questions along the way and things that you want to know, um, please, please, please. Um, I love it because it's so helpful to other students as well in terms of, um, you know, for you to, to clarify. Um, oh, thanks, Han. Yes, and great point. Um, Yes. Okay, Lily. Awesome. So great feedback here. So a couple of students have said how to introduce themselves. One student said introduce themselves. Um, and in fact, that's what I spend quite a lot of time on, which might seem a little odd, um, but I'll contextualize that in the interview process because my experience, um, uh, and I've actually seen um, another practitioner in a in a conference actually talk to this point as well. It's actually the, the when I when I do 
preparation and mock interviews with people, I actually see that that's the area that they do most poorly. So thank you so much um, for sharing that. And then the other question was uh, about being for, prepared for questions thrown at you. Thanks, Lily, because I'll also talk about how you can prepare yourself with a series of um, responses that but with that preparation so that when they do ask you uh, a particular question, because there'll be so, some similar themes, then you've got some responses ready that you can, um, in inverted commas, throw back at them. <laughs> so thank you. That they're um, really, really good points. I really appreciate that. Um, someone says, knowing what questions to ask when they say, Great. Okay. I like um, the things that you have covered there. I'm just going to make a note so that I make sure that I, um, they're in the, they're in the preparation, but just in case I forget. So um, questions at the end, always tricky. And I'll give you a few suggestions of what, in particular, what not to do as well with those questions. Throne questions. And the other one was introduce yourself. Any ah oh, awesome. We've got Tommy back, so that's great. Hi Tommy, welcome. We're just getting started. We're just about to do an overview. Please feel free to type any questions, put your mic on. Um, very, very informal here. I'm going to run through some slides, give you a couple of little activities to do. Um, but please sit back, um, enjoy, do whatever you need to do or want to do behind the scenes. Um, ask questions. It's, it's, a, it's a, um, a safe place to um, engage or just, um, you know, listen um, for what you need. Uh, in there if there's anything in particular that you oh what are your weaknesses yes and that's a really common you know th the thing is with interviews is there's so many there's so many common and 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 variations of the same or not always but there is a number all right great um tommy please feel free if there's something you'd like me to cover in particular um please feel free stefan is there anything you would like or need particularly from this workshop Anyone else? Oh, um, Jonas, same for you. Anything that I can um, offer that will be helpful? Okay, cool. Great. All right. So let's just start with... Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Jonas. Technique of the interview. Okay, yeah, so your technique. Okay, cool. Thanks, Tommy. Okay. So the purpose of the interview is to promote yourself to the employer, fairly obvious. Interview, um, it's the, the chance for the interviewer to learn about you and what, in fact, they're actually really, really focused on is... In fact, not so much what you say, of course, it, it is important, absolutely, about what you say, but what they're looking for, which is actually relates to this next line, is um, looking at how well you are going to fit within the team that already exists there. And I cannot express to you enough um, about how to, to, to ensure that you are the best fit. And that in fact is actually doing a lot of legwork before you get to this stage in terms of really trying to find the right employer, the right organization that is in line with both who you are. Um, so where there's that synergy, because then it, there's a much more um, a natural progression to that employment um, process than if, because uh, they've got, when you get to the interview stage, they're, you're down to the small percentage of, um, of candidates, right? So what they're, they already know, they, they already absolutely know that you can do the job, 
all right? They're confident because they've, you know, they've had to cull through 100 odd people. So what they're wanting, they've got a team of people, they've got requirements for that job, and they want to know how you're going to fit into, invariably, how you're going to fit into that existing team. So being able to build that rapport and demonstrate that ease with those people um, in that interview process. I mean, may not necessarily be the whole team there, but there will be representatives from that organisation that will be, um, to a certain degree, embodying, you know, the, the ethos, um, the, um, the company culture um, in that interview. So it's a, really about um, making that, making a connection with them um, and it can be hard, <laughs> um, particularly if you're in a remote um, setting. So it's a marketing exercise. So you are the product and you are promoting yourself as a product. So the employer is looking for, can you do the job? And invariably, they've already, for the most part, recognised that you can. And I put that in inverted commas. Will you do the job? You know, so how well are you going to be able to achieve those organizational objectives? And then are you the right fit? All right. So that fit is around. So will the person fit into the culture? So that's your work style, your personality, because you need to, they need to be able to visualize you working with those other people in that environment. And so that comes back to, so if this sort of seems a little bit abstract for you, I'd encourage you to listen to um, the first workshop. Oh, thanks, Alison. The first workshop in this series, which was on career success, because I in that workshop, I talk a lot about motiva values, motivations, and your attitude, because that will help you look for the right sorts of, um, so for example, you want to get into, we'll just use mental health as an example. There's a whole lot of different organizations in mental health. Um, and they all have a different sort of culture, um, different, um, different, like they'll all be working in that mental health space. But what I would encourage you to do, is, even if you're going to be going into that mental health sector in two years' time, start following them on LinkedIn, start finding out who are the recruiters um, there, start exploring them, and then start watching how they, and I say this in all of the workshops, start watching what they're saying, uh, the language, and, and then see if it really, that you just, it lights you up and excites you. That you think, oh, yeah, I'd really like to work for them. That's where you're going to be. A really good fit. Now, mostly these days, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future. But recruiters, um, pandemic, the pandemic um, has been really helpful for uh, the cost for recruiters, uh, and they'd already been moving in the direction of video um, interviews for large scale recruitment processes anyway. But for the most part, they will continue to stay online which of course has its um has its challenges um so there will so a panel just really quickly is going to be um two three four not going to be more than four people uh in an interview that is a panel an individual is going to be uh one-on-one -on -one. most likely it'll be two, unless you're going for jobs in academia it depends on the level um, oh, cool. Like to know about the dress code. Yeah, I can share my own um, uh, poor decision making around that a number of years ago. It was actually 20 years ago now, but <laughs> felt like it was it feels like it was about 10 years ago. Yes, definitely. Dress code is a, is a tricky one. Um, well, not tricky once you you think about, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, good one. I'll write that down. Dress code. All right. It comes up later in the slides. Thanks for sharing that. Um, if you're so academia, there'll be, you know, a number of people on a panel, government jobs, there will be a number of people uh, on a panel. There may be like they're going to say there's a couple of people, but, you know, these days things change all the time. So it may end up only being one other person on there. Assessment centres is most likely used in um, like when there's a, say you're going for some sort of um, uh, government uh, position 
where they will put you through a series of tasks. So it's when they're recruiting for uh, positions, again, where there's a high number of applicants and an assessment centre might be one of the final stages in a recruitment process. Um, please, if any, I won't talk a lot about assessment centres um, today, but if anybody wants to, um, thinks that that may be something that's going to come up for them, feel please feel free to reach out to me and I can go through um, more of that. It is for, they'll use it for government positions, but largely for, say, um, government internship programs, for law, um, sometimes accounting, they, uh, engineering, they use assessment centres for new graduates. And again, it's a way to get through to see um, how people act in certain, they actually, have, they do do it in, well, when, when there was a lot of people applying for jobs in the hotel industry, now we have a shortage. One of the assessment centres, it might be, say, Star Casino, and they'll get um, a group of people in and then they'll give them um, like a scenario where they have to wait on a table, for example, and then they watch how the person does that, just as an example. Of course, it wouldn't be the same if you're doing engineering. Engineering, they'll give you some sort of uh, problem to solve. They'll get you to do it in pairs and, and in a group, and then they'll get you also to do an individual activity over the series of a day, really intense. Um, so please, if anybody would like to know more about um, assessment, just reach out to me because I won't spend a lot of time on it today because it's less common, less common, also less likely in the postgraduate space than in, um, uh, not to say it won't come up for you, um, but other disciplines, and, and but also often at undergraduate level. So here are the five categories of um of interviews. So um, why are you here? Um, what can you do for us? What kind of person are you? So that's your values, your, um, your motivations, your personal attitudes, your work preference, start like your styles. What distinguishes you? Because now they've got you down to say, I don't know, five candidates. So what sets you apart from those others? And then can I afford you? So we had, um, the last time we ran this workshop, people asked me about that, where to pitch themselves in that process when they give you a, um, a range in that negotiation stage. I always say um, you aim your, your product. So you aim, you want to cover all of your costs and you want to make sure that you've got, a, you've got some profit in there for yourself. So you want to aim higher. But if there's a if there's a pay range of because sometimes you have to declare this beforehand, I wouldn't say go to the top top top. Go just below the top um, range, and then um, they're probably going to cut you down another five. But then you're still going to end up, up above. So if you start in the middle, you can't work up to your higher range. Um, so best. But then if you go super duper greedy and all the way. I'm not saying it's greedy, but, you know, you've got to know there's that fine balance between both knowing your worth, but also not isolating them from that negotiation process by kind of over pitching. If you, um, you know, that you've got 20 years experience and you know that you, you know, that you've got um, absolutely over and above and they'll be lucky to have you, sure, go for broke. But generally speaking, I'd say go um, go to your go to the top range, but within five or ten of that final um, that final mark. And happy to chat more at the end if anybody wants to talk about those sorts of things. Interview blunders, not being prepared. Uh, so that comes back to technique. It comes back so these things that people wanted to talk about when they throw questions. So I'm going to give you a, a practical way that you can. Um, that I actually use um, myself and it works really rather, um, re it depends if you're a visual learner, but it's something that, that's that been around for a long time and I've actually used it myself as a, as a way to, to prepare for those questions that are thrown at you. Short, what I see with people when they do um, mock interviews, so I'd really, really encourage you, if somebody's going for an interview soon or, you know, you're planning to, please feel free. I'm going to offer a few one-on-one um, -on -one consultations with me. 
Um, and that consultation, that one hour consultation, they will be uh, the end of, I've got um, uh, one today with you, Stefan. Uh, the rest of them will be next, uh, towards the end of next week. So I'll send out an email um, offering those. Please, if, the, if you think that will be helpful for you, we can talk about anything you like. It's really just to cap off this series. Um, it's kindly offered um, as part of this series from the Postgraduate Association. And if you wanted to do a mock interview, um, please, please, please take that. Um, it's a little bit terrifying, but what? But then I can give you really specific feedback around how to improve. So what we can do is just find a job that you may be applying, interested in applying for, and then I'll interview you for that job if you think it would be helpful. Because what I see, and I'm so glad that at least there's eight of you here, it's a shame that 25 aren't here, because what I actually see is when people practice, 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 they go from not getting the job in terms of whether I would employ them or not, in a really short period of time, they go from not not a viable candidate, primarily around the, the depth of the responses. It primarily, yeah, the, the depth of the responses, they're too short, they're closed. Um, and also the other main thing is, which we're gonna talk about is, is talking confidently about in that introductory, that tell us about yourself, that's the that is the first impression that they're going to develop of you. Inappropriate address. We're going to talk more about dress, uh, and that was um, something that came up in what uh, I think it was Tommy wanted to hear more about. So that's great. We'll talk more about that later. Bad mouthing other employers. Of course, I imagine that nobody's necessarily going to do that. But what you need to know. Or, or could be really helpful to know, is that both in your cover letter resume uh, and in the interview, the recruiters are finely, finely tuned for red flags. So if they ask you a question and you start to, you know, around your, your, why did you leave your previous employer? Um, because, you know, there's some, you know, some you're only there for three weeks or three months or whatever, and it looks different to your other ones. You've got to be ready for that. And they're looking for the hesitation, the uncomfortability that's going to come. So, being prepared for those, or you had a you had a sabbatical, or you, um, you know, anything that that you want to be at, um, prepared for that. But also, in particular, as it said here, bad mouthing um, past employers. You need to be ready with a positive spin on a negative experience, so to speak. So if their, you know, relationships break down, um, but you need to be able to frame that that previous poor experience or that gap in your, because they are, the, the employer, as I said, they're finely, finely tuned or the interviewer is finely tuned for those hesitations in your voice that <laughs> even if you're just on the phone. Not following up. Following up's a really interesting one. I've been talking to people recently about following up, not following up. It is absolutely essential to follow up after an interview. Um, relatively soon within that, um, within the week after. But don't expect, so because people are doing it much more often, don't expect that that will change the status, so to speak, of the outcome. It may... Um, contribute to good feelings and goodwill in that if they offer it to someone else, you've perhaps gone up a notch in terms of if things fall through. They've, they've pretty much, they come out of the interview and, you know, they not, they, they necessarily know immediately, but they they pretty know a, bit, a little bit of contradiction, but they know where they're going um, in terms of the, the recruitment. So I don't believe it will change the status, but I had had an example with a student that did it. She was a um, speech pathologist years and years ago. She wrote them this really beautiful thank you um, letter. And although they'd already decided, as I sort of say, that they were take, taking somebody else on, something else came up and they commented that it came up because she had written that really lovely um, thank you letter. So it's still worth doing, but perhaps don't hold any expectation that it will be, you know, uh, the be all and end all. So let's, um, let's pause there and I'd like to um, get you to type in the chat box Let's work through these. Is it better to be overdressed for an interview rather than underdressed? What do we think? True or false? Chat 
too. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I said I'd share um, a very general, yeah, thanks, thanks, Stefan. So I said I'd share a very embarrassing. So 20 odd years ago, I came back from, and I still think it's maybe 10 years ago, I came back from the Middle East and um, very, very, um, very formal work environment in the Middle East. And I came back to Lismore, um, uh, Lismore University, uh, SCU University to do, uh, I was applying for a research centre uh, position and I was in, it was summer and I was in the full suit and um, the director of the centre, he wandered out in his thongs and he said, g'day love. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed because I felt so overdressed. So um, I if I were to, to, to do that situation again, what I would suggest wherever you can is try to, so anyone that's on Lismore campus probably knows the staff dress nicely, but they're not wearing two-piece suits. And so I think that just having a suit jacket rather than the, the full matching pants that I had on would have been just fine. So you want to be a little bit over, but you don't want to be over because they still need to, imagine that they can see you in that work environment same with the other way around so for example I often see in a, in a unit that I teach um, that, that students want to work in places like the Marriott those five-star organizations if you want to work in a five-star so if it's Microsoft or Coca-Cola or IBM or whatever the five star, if you're going to work for the market leader, you need to look like the market leader. So often, yeah, students will be applying for those five star establishments. And it's not that they're poorly dressed, but they need to be immaculately dressed because um, that's what five star looks like. So, and when when they're looking for that employer, that yeah, they need to be able to visualize you there. So, I I, I agree with um, with Stefan in that it depends. The most important thing is that they can they can see you in that organization by the way that you dress. So, for example, I had an older student, and she was a, going for a job as a professional conference orga, organizer. She knew she knew what not that every professional conference organizer dresses the same way, but they have a certain look, and it usually has a little pearly necklace um, and quite formal. Uh, and I watched this lady. She even put a picture on her um, LinkedIn, uh, sorry, on her resume and on her LinkedIn, and she just looked exactly like a professional conference organizer. She got that job. So. Um, the best and easiest way to do it is to look and see what others are wearing. So if I use that example of I probably should have taken a little bit of a wander around uh, the campus at um, uh, Lismore and I would not have um, gone in in my, um, my two-piece Amani suit, which I would inherited from my mother and be proud of. All right. Um, so referring to uh, so what about the next one here uh, 90 the first 90 seconds of an interview largely impact how successful you will be what do you think the first 90 seconds what do we think true or false yeah absolutely and that that is the same whether you're interviewing face to face or online they will make it and it's a great shame really because um employers they make so much assessment about how you look and, and they've they've done these studies in, in terms of what they're actually um they're often not not even listening to what you're saying they're looking at those those other cues the body language the eye contact um, personality, that warmth, that connection. So although, yes, they're listening to the, they're, they're highly tuned to those other more subtle um, actions. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Uh, referring to pre-written answers during an interview, is it a good idea or not? Should you refer to pre-written answers during an interview or not? I would generally say no. I think in you were recruiting for um, 
New South Wales or Queensland Health, those sorts of roles where there's a, a, a different recruitment. Yeah, that's right. And you don't want really pre-prepared. It's still going to be, hopefully you're going to prepare and prepare and it's still going to be pre-prepared, so to speak. Um, but I think you're better off not to have that. For great, but it's it's not so relevant for you guys. Um, graduate health um, in that arena, it's it's appropriate. Generally, I'd say no. Is it better to ask questions at the end of the interview, uh, one or two? Is that true or false? Better to ask questions or not? Ah. Good. I'm glad we've got some mixed feedback on it. Oh, sorry. Yes, a trick question here. You got it, Stefan. It is better not to ask questions. It's so uh, that's false. So it's better to ask questions. And we'll talk about because that's one of the commonly, I've got this kind of little, this little kit bag of things that I see commonly done. Um, not not wrong, but where there can be improvements. So I'll talk about the questions uh, at the end. If offered a glass of water at the start, is it better to accept it or not accept it? Mm, tricky questions here. Do you take a glass of water? What do we think? Yes or no? Yeah, yep. Definitely. Also, um, in particular, I think it's the safest thing to do, particularly given that in, um, uh, so for example, in in, um, in Arabic culture, you, you know, that, that and in um, I think probably the, uh, the Italians, uh, where they want to, it's that generosity, that giving. And so the easiest thing is just to say, yes, it sits there. And then if you sip it, that's fine. So you just accept it and say, thank you very much. Um, asking about what the salary is in the first interview, is it a good idea or not? What are we thinking? Yeah, I would say no. Um, I, but I'll put a I'll put a caveat. So what I mean with like sort of a disclosure, a, 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 something that hangs over the top of this. I'd be really dubious or dubious. Okay, I'll use some words that um, I would be hesitant um, and cautious to a apply for a job where you have no idea what that salary range is because. Um, it just leaves you vulnerable. Um, I'm really, really conscious of watching how they present themselves um, and you know yourself, what you want, what you will and won't accept in it. And, and so the more you can, because you're going to enter into some sort of relationship with them. So if they're not willing to disclose before that interview the pay range, now you can in seek when you're looking for jobs, you put in your salary range. So that's one way. So say you're looking whatever, 50 to 70. When, you, when you're searching, that's one way. So even if they, when they have to put an ad up on seek, they have to declare it. So even if they don't put it in the job advertisement. But if there's a job going and it all sounds too good to be true, but they're not actually telling you there's no logo, there's no branding, it's a really short, I just steer really clear. So the, the more information, but then on the other hand, let me just put the other, other hand, if there's a job ad advertisement and you feel exhausted by the end, um, I would steer clear of that. But you want to want to look for one where you just, you read it and you think, fabulous, I'm really excited and interested and, and want to, but they disclose some sort of um, salary range. I wouldn't ask about the salary in that first interview. What they will do somewhere, and, and the whole process varies a lot from employer to employer, they will ask you your expectations, either in a pre-interview. Um, sorry, we've just got somebody coming in. 
Um, so sometimes they do like a pre-screening interview where if they want to cull down from say 15, 15 people down to five, they will do like a few short questions before they actually take. So be prepared for your phone to ring and they'll literally just put you on the spot and walk you through a few specific questions around, um, you know, are you willing to do the checking a few things? Are you willing to travel? Some of the things that are in the job advertisement, but then a few other things. So just be prepared for one of those phone calls. It can be a little bit disconcerting. And they may ask you about salary in that um, uh, and that's where I say don't go too because you may miss the opportunity to then get into that final pile if you go too high and they're asking your salary range in that um, welcome Katie I'm glad you're back we're just doing a little quiz we've still got plenty to come so I'm glad you're here uh, is it better to talk more about what I have done than what I have achieved Good one thanks yeah so it's if you've missed any of the other workshops we talk about the results this can be a little bit tricky to get your head around um, we talk about the results of your work so um, rather so the results uh, of your work rather than um, uh, rather than what you did so what you did is weighted on um, you know you had you worked on 10 functions and you served 150 people over the Christmas period. The results of your work would actually be that um, you received multiple feedback um, letters from your happy event clients that said how well you looked after them during those events. Um, you ensured that they had top quality uh, service. Um, you know, they have five-star service. You resolved um, any problems that occurred in relation to um, you know, the timing of the food delivery. Um, yeah, so it's the results of your work. And, and said, when you're first doing it, it can get a little bit tricky. It's generally a waste of time preparing for an interview. I've got jobs without preparing. Should you prepare or not? Suspect given that you're here, um, you probably know the answer to that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's not a waste of time. Prepare, 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 prepare. And what I and I would actually say, perhaps more equally, if not importantly, not just preparing, writing down all of your responses. You get a buddy, or you do. Um, you use the SCU careers team if it's sometime soon, or it's you know February next year when I'm back, and you've got interviews coming up. We sit in here and we just go round and round. I, I give you a few questions. We go bang, I give you feedback. We go again, I give you feedback. We go again. And you will transform in that situation, but you can do it online um, with Interview 360. I see students change enormously um, in their capacity to respond to questions, how they hold themselves by practicing with someone, someone you trust, someone that's going to coach you tell you where to improve not necessarily your partner that'll just that'll just tell you you're fabulous um, someone that will be helpful say that was great you could do this this and this um, you want and need that feedback because and feedback can hurt um, but if you think about it for improvement rather than how can I do this better next time then you can keep growing and I probably don't need to tell you that because you guys are here so you've already got that willingness really to take charge of your own career because that's what it's um, and, and our career today requires us to manage it ourselves more so than ever ever before sending a thank you letter um, I would say yes definitely but I wouldn't expect anything from that thank you letter I think it's courtesy um, we might have um, a little break there um, sorry Katie um, so just for you, we talked about um, just preparing for the interview. Um, we talked about the types of interview questions uh, and we will dive into my top tips uh, for success. So let's just take um, 10 minutes. I don't like to take too long a break because I don't, um, I know that it's so hard these days to stay and listen to something for so long. So I don't like to take too long in case you just go, oh, I'm too tired. 
So hang in there. Um, hopefully there will be, even if you're folding the washing um, and, you're, and hopefully you're listening from home, something will be helpful hopefully in, um, in this next um, hour. I'll be back at um, 10 to, yeah, sorry, no, five to 10.
All right, so get yourselves comfy and we'll kick off in one minute. What I'd like to say before I do kick off, um, and I know it can get a little bit um, repetitious, but I had this really, really interesting example recently where there's a, um, an academic colleague of mine who has been applying for a series of uh, positions um, and initially nothing was happening and then started refining uh, her application and then started getting um, started getting um, some hits, which was fantastic. Um, then got a series of interviews um, and learned things from each of those interviews through that interview process. Um, and there was some certainly some disappointment in that uh, in that process. But what actually happened in the end of this um, journey, so to speak, of, of going through this transition from you know a particular role, a particular environment, what I acknowledged and, and learned by being privy to that um, that experience for her was, that before being offered um, the position which she was just offered the other day. Um, so what happened was she applied for these positions, some academic positions, and um, and then it said there was some some great disappointment. And then she actually gave, not gave up, but she put it all down. And that might sound like um, you, there's something unusual that happens that you know you've got to put you put all the effort and the energy in but you actually uh, really very much so as the hippies say is that you actually have to let go of the outcome and so she put it all down but she'd actually applied for this other corporate position before that and then interviewed for that and I remember thinking oh well, that's an odd fit and, and I didn't know all the details of the job before getting the job she actually shared with me and she said oh this one's this job is actually a much much better fit for me the one that she ended up getting and I thought oh so you'll probably get it and um, so I guess in I want to I want to highlight a couple of things for you that I observed and and was reminded through my own process and, and other people's process you got to put in the action which you're doing by coming here but you do actually have to let go of the outcome and also if there's a, something you really, really want, which we generally, you know, we want to work for whatever GIO or, um, you know, Nestle or whatever it is, you take all the effort and work towards getting that interview, getting that job. But if it's, and all your efforts are going and they're going, you're going in a particular thing and nothing is happening, you actually then need to stop and do something else um, because, there's something that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, um, there's that expression that says you keep doing the same thing over and expecting a different result. So as you go through this transition, keep taking actions, refining what you're doing, keep getting feedback, try different things, start getting wins, do more of that, all right? Then um, if things stop flowing again, and there's actually science around, um, you know, how we work with flow, is if things aren't flowing again, put it down and pick up something else and then move towards that and then come back to that. Um, and so what ended up happening was she got this job, but it was a much better fit. And, and those were her exact words. Um, and, uh, and then she, you know, it all made sense in the end, but it was a very painful process 
um, for her. But it often, again, it's a bit like a hippie. It does always work out, but the, 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 the pathway getting there is often, we expect it to be a straight line and it's often not a straight line. And we get really upset when, the, when it doesn't happen the way we, and then we sometimes we either give up or we try harder, but there's actually another way, which is really just accepting it's not working for now. You don't chuck the bar and then you try something else, come back again. Um, or, or leave it until something else opens up or that you've got some extra qualifications. So uh, I hope that's helpful because I've, I've experienced it myself personally and I've observed many, many people in different forms go through this, um, through this process. So for another example, just really quick, was a nursing student, top, 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 the best in the, in the business and her recruitment process was really challenging for her she got there in the end, but she didn't quite get what she wanted. She's now, her picture is all over the billboards. There's a picture of her on the Gold Coast. There's a picture of her um, in the papers, in the advertisements, and she's just doing brilliantly. But her pathway wasn't straight in terms of getting there. So I hope that's helpful because the disappointment can, and the feeling of rejection, we put it, we can put it down. And then we stop doing it and then we give up and fall into a heap, into depression or anxiety or whatever it is that, that happens because nobody likes to be rejected. And I watched, you know, this, this um, you know, colleague go through this. Um, but what I saw her do was put a, I call them the Harry high pants. You put your Harry high pants on and you get back out there and you have another go or you try a different path, right? So... That's just a little side note, but it's really, really important. Same, you can actually apply those principles in, you know, whether you're buying a house or whether you're buying, you never let go of that vision, yeah, but sometimes you've got to put it down and do something else um, and then find another way to buy that piece of land or build whatever it is, whatever is you're building or working towards, put it down, let it go, find another way. You never let it go completely. All right. Welcome back, Leanne. So you're going to present your postgraduate traits. So the thing about um, one of the, the, both the challenges and great strengths of a postgraduate student is that sometimes it can be, it's, it's not as a, a seamless story. You've come back to postgraduate study for X, X, Y, Z reasons. So it's not as so, it's not as quite straightforward in terms of an employer understanding. So there's, and also understanding their fit. So you have to actually tell them um, things that they're looking for ways to eliminate. You need to tell them what you've got out of the benefit of being a postgraduate study, whether it's your PhD or. So you're, um, you're, you're solving complex problems. You're applying logic, critical thought and creative thinking. So through your postgrad, and, and that is what employers need at the moment, is cre creative thinking is not about, you know, painting, a, a painting a, um, you know, an abstract painting. It's actually about creating abstract paintings in, your, in the work that you do because our work environments are so, so, so complex and they change 10, 10 times quicker than they did 10 years ago. So that's where your skills as a postgraduate student um, ethical conduct so you will have had to through your research had to and ethical conduct applies to um, doesn't matter whether you're working for McDonald's or IBM ethical behavior is ethical behavior so um, but but it comes out of your postgraduate so it's a key um, it's a key transferable skill that fits into just about any role engaging in these ones a little bit more you know you're not going to apply it necessarily at McDonald's but you know, might be in McDonald's in learning and development or something. Research and um, analysis, interpretation, reflection, communicating effectively, both written and orally. That'll be, um, but it, you've got it through your postgraduate study. Now, the number of these for what employers um, are looking for an interview that this moves around a little bit. They are, the recruiters are looking for this from students both in undergrad and postgraduate level. It moves around the numbering moves. So what, if this actually these figures come out of a um, in, out of a graduate study, 
but then the order and the numbering changes um, a little bit. What has changed in recent years is around this cultural alignment um, because they recognise that if you are, um, uh, uh, that comes back to fit, um, that you will, so what your vision is for, you know, your whether it's around sustainability or economics or whatever your vision and how you fit, um, that is in line with theirs. And placement. So hopefully for any of you guys that are listening at home, if you haven't got any sort, sort of practical work experience, um, make an appointment with myself or the careers team to talk about how you get more experience, teamwork, um, emotional intelligence, et cetera. So these might seem really obvious. Um, punctuality, I would, if you've got to go live um, to a location, oh, I would allow so much extra time because then just get there, go into the bathroom and do what we call power poses. I'll show you some power poses. They actually work, <laughs> done them myself. And um, excuse me, sorry, I just ate some blackberries. I probably got them on my face. Um, uh, they, um, if you've, if you've got plenty of time, you've got time to just sit, chill, read over your notes, do all those things. So that might seem obvious presentation, um, professionalism. So really what professionalism looks like in that context is being aware that every single person that you encounter on your way to that interview may have an impact on the per on that final interview. So that means being courteous to, um, you know, the security staff, the lady that pulls into the car park next to you, uh, all the way, and it should be how you, you know, operate in the world generally, but you just need to be really mindful of what that, that holistic professionalism looks like. Knowing about the company, we'll talk more about that, super duper important. Um, project a positive and, and enthusiasm. Again, this one might seem like, oh, duh. Well, let me tell you that um, we used to run these um, employer, I'm just going to stop sharing for a sec. We used to run these employer where employers would come to the campus for, we used to do it at an undergraduate level. And we'd have this, um, they'd have this lady who would actually two different ladies, but from the same company. And they both said the same thing to me. Um, I said, oh, you know, what, what, what makes you employ someone? Two of them, two different years apart, same company though, they said positive attitude and enthusiasm. And I'm like, yeah, but like, it's a no brainer, isn't it? And they said, no. And they reminded me that what actually happens is people are trying to be perfect. They're trying to get all the technical skill, talk, talk about their technical skills, present perfectly, have their body right, you know, remember everything but they're forgetting actually to show how much they really, 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 really want to work for that company in that job with that team. And so if you get nervous, do you feel un unprepared, just um, A, try to make that, you know, you shouldn't feel nervous or un unprepared, you'll feel nervous. But let me say unprepared, you won't be because you've been here. But if there comes a point where, you know, you think, oh, go back to making that, that connection and building that rapport. So you say something like, you know, I've really, I've tried, you know, prepared so, so much for this, um, for this role. I've really desperately wanted, um, give me a moment to think. Um, so then you kind of, you give it creating some space, but you're also showing that enthusiasm and why you're, you know, why you're anxious rather than, oh yeah, hang on. Oh, and you fed it, forgetting to build that. This is going to be your future team, your future HR manager, People employ people they like. So if they don't like you, sounds sounds a bit brutal, but if they don't like you, they're not gonna, they're not gonna employ you. Simpler. And they're not gonna, but they will employ you if they like you and they can see you doing the job, even though you're not perfect. All right. So you don't actually have to be perfect in the interview. What you do need to do is convince them that A, you can do the job, you're gonna fit with the team, that you can step up, that you've got the right, generally speaking, got the right qualifications, but that you're gonna get along, you're gonna, and you've got that enthusiasm to do well in that. Um, in that environment so that is so so important so this um, recruiter said to said in this situation they were recruiting for an IT role and they ended up employing somebody who had a lot less experience 
um, rather than an older. And it's nothing to do with this. There's age. There is age both both ways. I see where they'll employ someone older rather than someone younger. So in the training, I had some people said they they weren't employing the younger people because the the people that were being trained weren't listening to the younger people. So in this but in this particular case, it was about the actual enthusiasm. It would wouldn't it would just in this case it was just that the younger person. Um, display the enthusiasm but the point was about the enthusiasm for the role so um, they ended up giving it to the person that really really wanted that role and was willing to do and to learn and to grow with the organization so um, I'm just going to pause again so um, I see students get really, really caught up, which is normal, caught up in trying to be perfect and forgetting that they've actually got to build a relationship because you, all of work is about relationships, relationship with customers, with teams, with suppliers, with students, with um, customers of any form. So at the end of the day, there is a customer in just about even if you're a teacher, there's a customer. If you're in education, there's a customer. Right, and that comes back to those communication skills. First impressions, so eye contact and smiling. Harder, you're obviously not going to shake hands in an online um, setting, but it's just immediately when that screen opens up, you show them your beautiful, happy, smiling. I want to be here. How can I? How can I make this happen um, with that warmth? So show your best, your best, warmest moment that you would with your family, with your, you know, with your loved ones. And then find familiarities, small talk. So this comes back to one of the early, you know, about you introducing yourself because before it kicks off, particularly when you're doing an interview in an online setting, someone's going to come in before the other one and there'll just be a little bit of light banter. That's really important because they're going to be a little bit nervous. Um, well, not necessarily nervous, but uncomfortable because it is uncomfortable they've got to interview it so you want to mutually put each other at ease so you help them by putting them at ease with that little bit of small talk as people shuffle around come in and out and then someone's screen doesn't work or so and so is running a bit late or whatever happens same with if it's in a live setting um you know, somebody gets there on time, somebody's been held up in traffic. So it might just be you and, and the first, you know, one of the people that's interviewing you, someone's been called into a meeting. So you're going to need to just, just ask them questions. How are you going today? Busy morning. So you can take that, that pressure uh, off yourself. Don't immediately go, well, how much, how, how, you, you, you. Um, but, but think about making them at ease as well. Um, so be on time. I always, always say, um, if it's online, I would say getting get everything set up and sit in that waiting room from 10 minutes on. They will not open that room up until probably right on the dot. But if you're sitting there, you know that it's not the day your computer's um, done, it's do, do going to do whatever it's going to do. Everything's plugged in. Just get, I would say, get set up and ready to go in there half an hour before because it will be the day that it shuts down and those weird things happen. If you're going to do it in Microsoft Teams, um, it will be in Microsoft. If it's online, it'll be Microsoft Teams or it'll be Zoom. Um, please, 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 please check all your settings. Get somebody else to go into that Teams meeting, a friend, family member, go in there and check that, you know, you've got your, your camera at the right height, the light, the lighting, oddly enough, um, is really, really important in this and the and the background is really important in, in this process. So I'm in Zoom with people all the time. And when people's lighting is um, is really sort of grey and it just gives it sort of a negative and dark, it gives a negative impression immediately. So lighting is really important. Um, energize, project confidence, manage that your self-talk. I'll talk more about that offers of water, except I'll talk about that managing that self-talk stuff. So one of the questions was, uh, or techniques, I'll come up to come to techniques in a minute. Um, so, well, this, this comes into techniques. Uh, I think it was you, Tommy. Um, so you want to make sure every job, research the employer, their values, um, be really up to date on, um, 
you know, what, what they stand for. So you're going for a job at Twitter. I mean, that's a bit of a, a too obvious one, but you know, they've just gone through a change. You've got Chief Twit that's arrived, <laughs> uh, Elon, Mr. Elon Musk. Um, but be up to date with what's going really well for them. That can help with the chitter chatter if you need to chitter chatter in that um, before people are arriving. But it also shows that if this is really, really critical. It really shows that you want to work for them, that you're not just going through the process of applying for any old willy nilly job and you'll go anywhere you want. They want to know that you want to work for them. Um, find out who the interviewers are. You can find this out. What I wouldn't suggest is um, you can find them on LinkedIn, have a look at, read about who they are, get a feel. You can't, um, but I wouldn't suggest trying to connect with them before the interview because it puts them in a pretty tricky situation in terms of perhaps um, even, you know, if it's a government position, any bias, any, you know, um, but with that said, if it says, you know, you, there's a, they often the job advertisements will say you can talk to someone about it. Certainly, you know, if you want to have a chat, but I wouldn't overstep that mark beforehand. Check location zooms. That is just absolutely critical. Read. There's, there's often lots and lots of instructions if it's a, you know, government, academic position, uh, any of those um, uh, more formal type positions, there'll be a whole host. You've got to click on this and go in here and register for this and blah, blah, blah. So there's often lots and lots of instructions. Make sure you read all of those instructions. What will I wear? Research the, yeah, so look at what people in their organisation, you can have a look on their website, look at what other people in, you know, accounting, for example, where to work. Um, practice, practice, practice. So SCU um, Careers, they have a program called Interview 360, um, but I would actually suggest um, using both so using a person so you want to be memorable for uh, the right reasons what is your point of difference and how are you unique so for example maybe you've lived you know I know a few of you guys are um, international students that is actually your point of difference that is your power because that's um, about being able to adapt to new environments it's about being able to um, you know quickly learn um, uh, to be in a different, yeah, different environment, cultural, uh, adjusting to cultural, managing yourself um, away from home. It demonstrates adaptability, courage, willingness. Uh, and those are all things that employers um, want, just as an example. Or you're a mature age student and not, our first thought will be, oh, well, I'm older. Actually, no, you need to flip that in your head before you go in there because that's your powerhouse that's who you are that makes that is your point of difference because you as opposed to a new grad who's never left home before and you're going into social welfare social work and you've got an extra 10 20 30 years life experience holy moly um that's where or nursing where the benefit of all that life experience all the highs and lows things that have gone right and wrong that's your that's your point of difference uh, so Often the things that we are most anxious about um, can actually be um, what I find happens for people is the things that you're anxious about, you end up, people end up um, drawing attention to them in, um, say, for example, um, it could be that English isn't the first language, so then people will be, or, or a lack of experience in a particular field, say practical experience, and, and people will draw attention to that lack of experience. Oh, I don't have that experience. So rather than saying, well, actually, I've done X, Y, and Z, and I, you know, I can actually more broadly demonstrate that I know how to do that. It's really normal. Uh, it's really, really common to do. And I tell you, once you do it a couple of times and you make that fatal error and you think, oh, I've just told them the thing I'm worried about, um, you probably won't do it um, again. So thinking about what makes, and that's where if you need to work with myself or with um, Susie, the careers to find out, you know, what are your strengths? What are um, those those parts of you both personally and professionally 
you know, that you've had to manage adversity, you've had to support yourself, um, you know, during a pandemic on the other side of, you know, the world with things changing, whatever it is um, that you've actually had to overcome. Uh, they say, make your, um, there's a lovely um, yoga expression. Um, he talks about a guy that I, um, uh, a guy that I follow and, and he, he talks about, he's, um, yoga is one of my, um, one of my side hustles in, in my work. And he talks about how you make your mess your, your success. So it doesn't necessarily mean emotional mess or, or whatever. It just means the mistakes that you've made, then you look at all well, the learning from that and then how you make that a success or the, or the things that you've had to overcome in terms of that, those, and that becomes part of what you then build into your story. And in fact, it is the art of storytelling. My, um, one of my old colleagues, um, as your former career consultant, uh, she likes to talk about um, the interviews as a, you're having a conversation. And then that actually takes the power out of that sense that they have, um, actually that they have power over you. They do only if you think that they do in that we give away our power. So you want to come to that interview with actually you've got a whole bunch. So power is about um, how much resources. So you actually have, if they've decided you're going into that interview, they've realized that you've got some resources internally that they need, right? Based upon your skills, experience, um, qualifications, right? Because that's, so if you think about oil and gas, um, people, um, when oil is scarce, of course, price goes up um, and you have more power. So when you go into that relationship to have a conversation about how you can fill their needs, you know, their need for oil and gas or whatever it is in their, in their organisation with what you have to give, then you can go in from that middle place rather than give all your power away and then it's yes, no, three bags full. You don't want to say, I've had a couple of instances where, you know, the students have practiced interview they've interviewed me I wouldn't um you know in a, in a practice session I wouldn't certainly say go that far because that's kind of a red flag as well you don't need to be dominating but you do need to know that you're if they called you in for an interview you got the goods yeah so you really just have to communicate um what your why is which is why are you why are you there and you're there because you know, you've seen that they're the best in the business, that they're growing, that they're doing amazing work in Hong Kong, Singapore, Sweden, that they've got the most incredible research portfolio. They're, um, you know, they're looking after the well-being of, um, you know, individuals in the disability space. That's your why. And your why will be there if you pick people you really, really want to work for. Don't waste your time um, because you will waste a lot of time if you just go, oh, okay, I'm a new grad, I need to get a job. No, take extra four days, four weeks, right, if you can, and then really think about getting all the help that you need. Get that story really clear about, I suggest you do it before then so you don't lose you need the financial thing, but spend more time getting ready to go out into that workplace, looking for those gaps in what you, and you're doing it already by being here, fill in those gaps of, so you need to do some extra learn, micro learning, you need to get a first aid certificate. What are those things I need to stand out? Then you get ready, find and start finding who you really want to work for. So, you know, maybe it's life, lifeline or headspace or whatever. All right, what are the people doing there? How am I going to communicate? How am I going to get in there? Tell your stories with a, ah, so this is where your star. So we did this in our selection criteria workshop a few weeks ago. So what you're going to do in, they're going to give you um, the requirements for the job, right? And in your cover letter and your um, perhaps a set, separate selection criteria, you're going to give them a star, which we did a few weeks ago. I think it was like, oh yeah, last week, um, where you're giving them examples of where you've actually in similar workplaces or similar settings, or it doesn't even have to be, but a situation where you've actually demonstrated results in that um, that are related to the requirements of this job. So, for example, when I was working at um, Tweed Hospital, um, I had a patient that um, was, uh, you know, suffering 
that, that had a panic attack. What did I need to do to solve the problem? Uh, I had experience in you know, mental health first aid, so I did X, Y, Z. Um, and was able to, um, you know, by squeezing the individual's hand, um, getting them to focus on their breath, et cetera, et cetera. And then what was the result? The person for the first time was over, able to overcome having a panic, panic attack in a public setting. Um, they thanked me. They also wrote to my supervisor to say how helpful it was to finally have a tool uh, as to how to manage um, their anxiety disorder. There you go. So. Um, that is, and of course, you guys aren't going to have um, those sorts of examples, but you'll have a variation of there's a problem in the business. Um, there's something you've identified through your research. What did I do? Well, I, you know, um, I wrote a paper on and we did a particular study on, you know, X, Y, Z. Then I was asked um, to commission a report on blah, blah, blah. Then I was also given, um, it was sent out to all the CEOs. Um, and of course, these are quite large examples that I'm giving, but remember that example I gave of the hospitality um, example, it's the same thing. It, it, it doesn't actually have to be that you save the company a trillion dollars. Um, it needs to be related to the specific um, where you're at. So don't be overwhelmed by the, and it's the quality of what it demonstrates about who you are, um, th those personal and professional attributes. So this comes back to one of the um, one of those the tell me about yourself. Whew. So those first couple of minutes, you come into the room, shuffle around, whether it's online, um, and they're going to ask you some icebreaker questions. Now, it's a bit of a warm up. It's in those early, but it is really this is what is done most import uh, most poorly in every single time I've done. Just about yeah, I can't yeah. I'd say ninety nine percent of the time, if I'm working with students, they can talk about all their. They've got great um, examples of their research, of their their service to their community, their um, other constituents, whoever they are, but get them to talk about who they are. Woo! Um, tricky, tricky, tricky. So, um, and then the, the why do you want to work for us is done a little bit better. Um, and if the role aligns with your future, blah, 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 say so. So, When you're going to go into, so they're going to ask you, and this comes back to, um, I think it was Tommy about technique and, and that, and also it comes back to the, they're going to throw lots of questions at you. Um, how do I overcome being thrown lots of questions? What I suggest that you do, um, I found it really, really powerful, is you get a big piece of A4 um, cardboard and you write um, you put some some keywords. Uh, I wonder if I've got it in this slide here. No, I haven't. I've got it in some different slides. So you're going to write some. They're going to ask you things like teamwork. So put you put teamwork on in a bubble on the page. Write the word teamwork, and then for example, think about all the ways. And this is even if you're you know going for a senior academic position or whether you're going for a job with. Um, you know, Microsoft or whatever, they're going to want to know how well you work with other people, right? So teams, individuals, whatever. So then you, you want to come up with the best examples of who you are and how you work in a team. So you can just draw all these arrows out from there. So you'd have university worked in on a project and we achieved da-da-da by doing da-da-da. I had a part-time job while I was at university and I had to, um, you know, work with the packer pickers um, on a construction line, we had to make sure that, you know, we had efficiencies and blah, blah, blah. Then you've got, um, you work for, you know, five years doing this. And so you, you pick all the things, what you can in fact actually do is in the job advertisement, it'll tell you the selection criteria. So you can, so it'll say, you know, work as part of a team, evidence of research, you know, if it was an academic position, evidence of research or service to the community. And then on that big A4 piece of paper, you give all the, you write some arrows of all the times that you have done that. 
um, all the different examples of that. So when they throw you a question, because often the questions are similar in that they'll say, well, what are your strengths? And you'll remember that your, so your strengths could be, they could ask you, what are your strengths? They could also ask you, what are your greatest achievements, which are gonna come up next. Um, they're not one and the same, but they are because you use your strengths to get your achievements. So if you do some, what we call mind mapping of the key themes from that, job description and you write the word so it might be um, it might be customer service so you'd write customer service on that a4 paper and then you'd write down every time in your life that you've had to serve service a customer so you've had a retail job um, or another word that they put in all the time is your communication skills so you have to communicate when you're playing sport you have to communicate so that's a way that you visually and then you look at that before the interview you write as much fill up that whole a4 with as many versions and as many examples for each of the things that they're asking for so when you go into that job interview and they throw you a question you will actually get like a bit of you'll be like oh okay well um so they'll say um they'll say, well, give me an example of how you communicate. And you'll be like, oh, well, I remember I wrote the word communication down. So you'll be able to say, oh, when, I'm, when I work in a team, uh, so when I, when I played sport, volleyball, um, I made sure that my directions were really clear to my teammates. Um, I helped them to work, work towards a goal because you're trying to you know, score a goal or whatever. So they love, tech, so they love sporting events. They love part-time work. They love casual work. So you've actually got so much actual additional experience and happy to work with any of you guys that want to spend that hour unpacking any of this um, because it's going to go into your resume and your cover letter. And so then you're prepared for all the different ways they may throw those same, same questions to you, but they sound different. You're also going to write a list, which you should have done as part of your cover letter and your resume a list of all of your achievements. So um, these are just examples. So most people have done some sort of sport or some sort of volunteering. Don't panic that you haven't increased sales figures by 100%, you know, if you're still young. Um, so just remember this, this is about you, your achievements. And if you keep, I believe that those that come to these workshops we're going to have a whole more because you're actually already learning how to, you know, to ask, not necessarily to ask for help, but you're engaged, you're realizing that you need to engage in this process to help you. Because as um as a lady who I really enjoy, you've probably seen a, a lady called Mel Robbins, and she says, Nobody's coming for you. <laughs> I was like, oh, like no one's coming to get you, get you to they're not going to come invariably, they're not going to come and ask you to apply for that job or come and get you out of bed in the morning. Um, she's great. She's actually just, I haven't listened to it yet. She's got a podcast um, and she's just got really simple, really helpful ways of, you know, like just get up, just do it. <laughs> uh, but I don't need to tell you guys because you guys are here. So you already know um, uh, how to uh, do it. Now, weaknesses was one of the other. I haven't got it. I made these slides, I think from memory, a little bit shorter. Yep. Than the other one. Um, I'll close this off. Oh, I just want to show you quickly, and then I'll go through each of these questions, and then we've got plenty of time to answer uh, any questions. So this is where this program, Interview 360, is. Now, you can actually program it, um, and you can actually put in um, uh, the types, like the, the type of profession you want to be interviewed for, and that will be really helpful Um for, I can't remember who it was, it was whether it was Lily or um, Han, somebody asked about being thrown questions. That's another great way to just be practiced and then without any sort of shame in front of, or feeling of shame. There's no shame. Um, it's that feeling of shame that happens with, with a human being. So if you do it with a machine, then the machine can throw those questions at you and you can um, go through that challenging process of you know, getting it all wrong, making all those mistakes rather than making them when you get into the interview. Now, the other one was around um, weaknesses, which is a great one. Um, 
And I do this one often in different settings um, where I work with people and practicing, uh, practicing the weaknesses. And what I'd say about weaknesses is um, that, that everything, all the, all the people that talk in our profession about how to address this question is always just looking for what, what are you, how are you, uh, we all have weaknesses, so that's the first thing. It's important about the weakness that you choose. Um, so just check, ask somebody which weaknesses that you should use. Um, but then be prepared. Do you want to talk about how you're using your weakness um, uh, to overcome? Like, how are you working on improving that? So, for example, it might be administration because you don't really enjoy it and you find it fiddly. Uh, so how are you improving your administration? So you could say, well, I'm, you know, like I'm setting myself a little timer and 20 minutes around, you know, keeping my notes up to date, um, using some uh, additional um, administration tools for filing. Um, I've talked to one of the staff who loves doing administration and asking for her tips around how to manage my outlook and um, how to use Word effectively and those sorts. So what is it, what is it that you're actually doing to improve on them um yes I'll, I'll take questions um and the other so dress um slightly above um oh so what questions to ask at the end i would always suggest not asking and, and oddly enough most people when i do this practice with them they'll always ask about when can they get the next job and when how much money are they going to get i would I wouldn't touch either of those with a 10 foot barge pole uh, because what can happen is that the person that's interviewing you uh, may be perhaps younger, less experienced. And if they see you as a threat that you're going to go gunning for their job, um, they will not employ you. So you just want to be really mindful of who is, um, who is on that panel um, because it could be, you know, they may have biases for whatever, or whatever it is. And you can't manage all of those biases you know, last week I said, if you know, if your hair's blonde, you know, they don't, like, don't like blonde hair, whatever. But you can manage what you say. Um, so ask them anything to do with the requirements of the role. What do you like about working here? Actually, I had a friend. It was a while ago, a year ago, and she said she asked. She asked some great questions. Um, she asked them about. Um, she asked them about the culture. She didn't get the job, thank God, because I think she said she got a real red flag when she said it was a red flag for her. She asked them about something to do with the, the company culture and she said that they just got really, uh, perhaps, I don't know whether, well, maybe she didn't get it because, but anyway, I think it was probably she dodged a bullet. Um, she said they got really uncomfortable. And um, so if they're really not uncomfortable, like if they're not comfy and delighted to talk about their role there, if they don't look happy and really loving what they're doing and you don't get the job, don't worry about it. Um, because if they look happy, confident, comfortable in the work that they're doing, you want to work there. But if they look really tense and, you know, I don't know. So just be on the lookout for some of that sort of stuff. Um, particularly if what happens is that I find that when you're hot, you're hot, you're not, you're not. And so when you're hot, it something energetically goes out to the world. You won't be getting interviews for ages and then something shifts in you and then suddenly you're going to have options. So be on the lookout for if you're having to make decisions, use a little bit of that intuition around, you know, who did you click with? So just because they offer you the job um, and you can't control all of it, just because they offer you the job and the, but think about just try to tap in a little bit more. Um, and there is some science around intuitive decision-making versus um, rational decision-making. And they say the best form of decision-making is when you make that the combination of both. So if you, something is uncomfortable, be alert for that. Um, because often we get information and it's often the quieter voice that we need to keep an eye on. Um, so questions around so company culture, uh, but certainly things that they like about the job, what, what a typical day would look like, the induction. Um, uh, other people ask things around, you know, like, um, oh, 
you can ask them, you know, what they would what what they would be hoping for you to achieve. So if it was a, a slightly higher level position in the next six to twelve months, you know, what what are their key key goals, accountabilities that would be that would be suitable. Steer away from um, any kind of anything that just looks like you're there to get a step towards something else. So that would be around working offshore, working in a different branch. Because people say, oh, you want to look ambitious. You do, but you don't want to look like you're a, you're a flight risk as well. So you want to look like you, you want to be with them, with that team, ready to go. Um, uh, I think that's, that's enough of me talking. Any questions? Or, or what gaps am I, am I missing for you guys? Stefan, you've got quite a lot of experience in this area. Anything you would like to add or anything you agree or disagree with? Um... Oh, yeah, huh? Yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks, Stefan. No worries. Um, uh, yes, Han, please tell me. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question because um, now I'm applying jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, is uh, like uh, this time, I mean, nearly Christmas is not a very yes. good time mm. to apply in jobs. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, yes and no. Um, still right. Like if, so are you, are you, are you just, you've just finished your last placement? Oh, uh, yes. Nearly next week. And, uh, yeah, and uh, actually, I got an offer, not an ideal one. I'm still like uh, playing other jobs, but uh, not too many like a uh, feedback or you know like a uh, phone call, or, you know. And uh, I think, uh, and my friends say, yeah, maybe it's nearly like a Christmas day. Yeah. So yeah, in the last now is actually still. Um, they're still recruiting. It does definitely. It all it all slows down, but um, depending on how much time, what you can do is just sort of if you you know desperate for money, um, you can just sort of get something to get you through. But it's a a really good time to start sort of unpacking, looking what you're getting, all everything ready for when people come back fresh in the new year and then they start recruiting again. So in some ways if you can just sort of get some immediate work or take a break yourself, it's a, a really nice time to, you know, get the help with myself, get all everything ready in that downtime. And then as things do, but it's not to say that people don't recruit. It's just that final, it's probably from the middle of December through till the middle of January, right? Um, that, that you've, so it's only really a month. Um, but, you know, there's no, there's no sort of fixed things with this because the landscape has changed a lot. There are skills gaps. There are, it, it's just such unknown territory. So I wouldn't even say, certainly I would say middle of December to middle of January, that won't change. But it's not to say that they're not going to need people. Yeah, it's just, it's, 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 things have just changed so much from three years ago where it's things that the power is actually so much more with the employees so, and also I'm quite mindful that if we, we got it, we manage our thinking through this process. So if you start thinking, no, there's no jobs, what happens is there's no, there's no jobs. Yeah. Because then we keep thinking, no, there's no jobs. No, I won't be able to do this. Then your actions, then you start acting in a certain way. Yeah. Oh, there's no jobs. So then you start putting, and then you, you get more depressed and you get, you connect with less people you ask. And, and so what then happens is you feed your own reality, if that makes sense. Not you, but all, yeah, of us, yeah. all of us, we do it. So really importantly, you've got to manage your own mindset around it. And, and, mm -hmm. and actually, because what you believe is, so to speak. <laughs> so just, um, I think it's a great time for you, actually. Um, and, and happy if you want to yeah, meet up and we can look at what, what you've got with your documents, where you're going. Great time to prepare great time yeah so then you go in and like you say you're not just accepting one job that doesn't quite feel right or you take that job that doesn't feel quite right just for now 
yeah? So you look after your financial if you need to. So you have a two-pronged approach, yeah? So you just feed the feed the baby, you know, feed the cat. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm thinking because I two years full-time study, I really yeah. need a job at this moment. I don't want to wait after January because, course, yeah. yeah, financial issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's what, but and I think that's where people get caught out. Like we can get really fixed and we think, oh, I've just it has to look like this or it has to look like that. Sometimes we have to do three jobs while we're trying to get that other job. Sometimes we just to choose one that's not perfect, but we know I'm going somewhere else. Yeah. So then you keep that momentum that you look after those other aspects. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. You. You're going to be fine. <laughs> you're already doing Thank it. You. You're coming along. So you, your streets ahead. Um, uh, let me see what we've got. Ah, oh, okay. Right. I'll come back. Thanks, Leanne. Awesome. Lived experience. Amazing. I'll come back to that. Oh, here we go. So we'd like to ask about on, go, uh, about on the job education and training. Yeah, thanks, Leanne. Again, I'm just, it, this is just a personal preference, but I, I think you really want to be demonstrating um, not what, how can I get more from you? I know that most, most people want to go ask about ongoing training development because it's, it's part of your decision to get that job. So I'm, I definitely don't negate that. But we want to, they really, from the employer's perspective, they want to see because they actually have the power in, in, because you want the job. They have a little more power than you, but not much. We don't, let, don't want to give them too much power. So I would be thinking more about you're asking questions that are associated with how you can contribute more because soon into the job, you will find out more about those you know, additional, you can get it and you can even get a bit of a sense on, you know, the, even the way they uh, they write the job advertisement, it'll say, you know, we offer ongoing training and development. You can see a little bit of that stuff beforehand. Um, so I'd probably steer clear of it. Um, ah, so Stefan, hopefully, hopefully that's helped. So you want to be asking more about so they can see she wants, he or she wants the job, but they're trying to find out more about how they can can fit in and contribute with what they've got because they're looking for you at an existing where you are currently. They're not employing you for the, the you after you've got that training. So you want to be asking for those questions about you for now, about how how that how I can best serve you. And the question be related to that. Best serve sounds a bit subordinate, but uh, Stefan said, what about if the eligibility criteria is curious to learn and eagerness to pursue personal development, curiosity to learn. Oh, I love it. Oh, I'd go for a job that said curiosity to learn and eagerness to pursue personal development. So um, that would be a hard criteria if you, um, you know, if you aren't doing that, but you could quickly start to think of some things that you could immediately do. So for example, you could talk about, um, you know, some micro credentialing and then quickly enroll in some micro things, you know, my, um, some MOOCs. So there's massive online classrooms, which are free. Um, you could talk about, um, uh, and tricky, because you don't want to, you don't want to do, give them things that, but curiosity to learn is about being a lifelong learner of which you're demonstrating by way of your postgraduate study anyway. You wouldn't be doing a postgraduate, any postgraduate study if you didn't have a curiosity to learn. Um, but then you could also describe what a curiosity to learn means for you and then how you so what are you curious, what does curiosity to learn mean for you? So curiosity to learn for me personally is, is about that um, having, so you could talk about, for example, you could look up, um, uh, I can't think of a surname, Carol, um, is, uh, so it's uh, growth mindset. That would be a nice, easy one to, um, it's very growth mindset um very common and that you it'd be pretty safe one to talk about so you could say that I'm you know that and you could you could 
you could jump onto some stuff about growth mindset in two seconds. She's on YouTube. She's written books. Carol Dweck, I think her name is. And that is actually about, um, you know, learning to not, yeah, learning, a uh, le- little bit of learning to fail, but, you know, le- learning to learn for the love of learning to grow rather than um, that you're not going to do it well, so to speak, that you, and that you haven't got the skills yet, but that you can develop those skills. So, so looking at growth versus it's it's a growth mindset first versus a fixed what they call a fixed mindset, which is someone who is actually not curious to learn and they have a fixed way of doing things. So employers are really focused on employing people that um, it, it's very it's a very modern criteria actually. Um, so and it actually says a lot about a potential employer who um, I think it's a, a really that's one of the most um, appealing for me personally, one of the most appealing criteria I've seen, because it means that they value growth. They value somebody that that embodies that. And you're doing that by your research. And so you're really just saying, well, I mean, I actively engage in, you know, I attend workshops, I go to seminars, I do. So, So you're just giving them examples of things and then pick some safe safe practitioners in that space so the growth mindset carol dweck stuff would be a really safe one to use yes katie hello um i only could double that just had two oh, other yeah. questions but um so um what's my first one so you said about um not necessarily connecting with the people who are going to be your interviewer say on linkedin and i want to work hopefully in like government policy and stuff so I can see how that's yeah that's an important thing um but I remember you've also said that like building your LinkedIn and connecting with people in those fields so I was just wondering if I was you know going out and connecting with people and then I go oh I've got an interview with this person and we had connected is that an issue or is that so it's just not like if I go and like then but yeah. go out of my way to connect with them kind of thing. Yeah, great. Um, this is actually a really great segue. And I'm kind of exploring some of this myself at the moment and watching things that work, What because I think, you know, that theory to practice is, and I think that one of the most important things about connecting with people on LinkedIn for a future vision mm-hmm. is that when you do make that connection with them, that it's really important that you say, thank you, lovely. Thank you for connecting with me. Love, you know, so then... When, it, when it's six months time or 12 months time that you're going for that job, they remember that although you haven't got a relationship yet, that, that you actually took two seconds to say something. And you can, I would encourage you even to go a step further and open up a little tiny dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, because if it's a bigger vision, open up a little dialogue hey I love you know you don't have to say hey but I love the work you're doing in you know yeah. um, one some, somebody wrote something wonderful that I saw they said um you know that you, you can compliment the person be careful that it sounds a bit too sucky but something along the lines of you know that that they're the expert and that you're really looking to to learn from them so that would be really appropriate and then if it's six months 12 months time and then they happen to be the interviewer you don't necessarily need to do anything because then they're going to probably look up your linkedin as part of the process and it will yeah you yeah could. yeah I'd take some more feedback then on how to, I might chat to my colleagues about how you would then raise your profile stepping back in but I'd yeah. certainly say if it's beforehand, six months, 12 months, three months even, go yeah. for it, yeah? yeah. yeah. If it's right in that recruitment phase, yeah. stay right away from it. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that makes sense. That's great. Because Thank you. They're not even really thinking about who, they're just probably, you know, they may be whatever. It's like, no, back off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Great. And then my other question was, um, I think you said um, previously too to just obviously be looking for those. I've not finished my PhD yet, but I'm hoping to finish around February and to be looking for those jobs. Mm. Um, and then would I, so if I found like, if I was looking next week and I found, oh my God, this is this is a great job. I really want it. And, and also, you know, being in that policy, would I just apply for it? Or is that going to be like, 
if I apply for it and I'm not, you know, maybe not fully ready, but I kind of want to get that experience, but I don't want to like apply for it and then not get it. And then like three months later, they're like, oh, that was that girl who wasn't very good. Cause I really want that, like, ideally uh, okay. that one policy job in, in right. the government. Yeah. Great question. And this will apply probably to most of you guys. Um, well, and they say it in terms of starting a business as well. They say, say start before you're ready. Um, and so I would actually, I've had many, many, many examples of students that get the job of their dreams before they're, they're, before they're all ready. So if it's two months out, three months out, you tell them when you'll be finishing. They're not going to care. Um, it means a lot to us. You know, we know we haven't finished that unit or that final part and you haven't got the sign off on your, your thesis or whatever. They don't care less. Yeah, because three years as opposed to two, two point, you know, two point eleven months. Yeah, they don't care. So that's a really, really good question. I So that applies to anybody that's here that's finishing up soon. But it also equally applies to. Um, I think it was Lee that's just starting that also you can get if it, I had an amazing oh I had one of the student osteopaths the other day and she had actually had eight years of experience because she was doing the two simultaneously so of course that won't be your situation Katie but um, that is another if you get that opportunity to work and you extend it out that's another brilliant way to do it. So um, I would, yeah, I would not wait until you've got that. That applies to everybody. Don't wait because that job may not be there again. So yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Great questions. Thanks, Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely to see you again. <laughs> um, could you mention in the cover letter that you expect? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Great question. Yes. And that would be the same for any study. Yes. So you say, You'd be very, very clear. So you don't want to put anything, you don't want to give the impression that you finish when you're not. Um, but if it's in, I think even if it's November and you're expected to finish in February, I honestly don't think they're going to care. Um, so uh, unless, you know, there's some specific government legislation that says it has to all be. So for example, it's a little bit trickier with nursing because of the law around that. Um, a little bit tricky with aspects of law. Um, so yeah, but generally speaking, um, I would start if you're finishing up in February or even if you're even if you're just starting and you and you're here, you can get cracking on all of this. Um, because the more the more you put into this foundational stuff and the more clarity, there's a lot of there's a lot of research coming in, uh, coming out at the moment in the coaching career development space around the clarifying of our goals, visualization. Again, it sounds all a bit hippie, um, but one of the things that they talk about is actually visualizing yourself sitting in that office visualize yourself driving hopping on the train walking into the room visualize sitting in the chair flying on the plane to do a conference in Switzerland or Hong Kong and that you continue to do that visualization practice and what then ends up happening is that your, your actions then you start to act as if so you act as if which is a, a common term but um, yeah I find it really exciting because it's kind of that merge um, between some of that stuff that we know that animals, you know, they work more intuitively, uh, people with dis disabilities use those other aspects of their minds and their, um, their psyche. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's exciting times. Um, but what it means is that we're learning more about how our thoughts There's some really interesting research coming out of um, Berkeley, which I've mentioned before, and it talks about our beats so our beliefs, emotions, actions, thoughts, and I can't, I can still can't remember what the S is, but all, but what they say is um, that uh, how you then go about in the world based upon your beliefs, uh, your beats in inverted commas, that then becomes your reality. And so they say, um, they say that then you so 
um, you start to, and, and actually some stuff around, again, the stuff that hippies would, would say, well, I put hippies in inverted commas, around vibrational stuff. So then you actually start to attract, as your beats change, you start to attract different people that then changes, you know, how you get around in the world. So it's really exciting. There's lots of really helpful stuff that's coming out with the science around, um, you know, getting those things that you want. But also it's not about getting them because the science is also around um, finding the work that then, so there's, if you haven't, I've talked about this one many times, but they use it in lots and lots of different, I've come, they use it in coaching spaces. They've used it in some of the study that I've done. It's called um, the VIA character strengths. I've talked about it often. If you haven't taken the study yet, it's a study done by a group of scientists all around the world and they study people's character, slightly off topic here. So it's via character. I think it's, um, they're called via character strengths. It's a 20 minute survey, but it, it, this might seem slightly off topic, but I'm actually quite interested in the, you understanding or thinking about this process holistically from career success from the beginning, getting that prep, getting it, being able to communicate that in your resume cover letter, um, and then communicating and then, you know, actually attracting the right sort of work where you're going to really thrive and you'll get that through your learning more about your character strengths and then working in the environment where you can be like the, the character strength survey is that every individual has a set of strengths that they then can take into their personal and their professional lives for maximum well-being so it's really interesting i find it interesting anyway there you go uh so any uh let, what else do we have there so the cover letter yep conferral oh the power stances ongoing it yes so the the final thing yes um so here is this is amazing so again it's in that whole realm of things that seem a bit woo woo there's a lady done who's done a ted talk called amy cuddy um, and she talks about power poses. She talks a lot about body language. Really, really helpful. Oh, no worries, hon. Um, I do too, because I've got one minute now and I'm going to go in a meeting with you, Stefan. Actually, in fact, you could just stay here. Um, is uh, the power poses. So Amy Cuddy talks about power poses. Um, and one of the power poses is, I'll see if I can put my own. I can't see myself. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Turn my camera back on. Oh, here I am. All right. So one of the power poses, I think she has like, um, like a superwoman pose. And so um, I've, I've had a, said I had a, a student sort of done it. Um, I've done it myself. I went into uh, into the toilets. <laughs> Actually, I know girls and my colleagues have done it where you literally... So what they say is that you you actually it changes the by doing a power pose like you know superwoman superman but that you move in a really powerful energetic way and um, the science from this lady um, is that it actually changes something in your chemical makeup that you come across um, and, and well because you start to feel differently by going I got this Woo! and when you go into the interview. Um, they can that sense that you're in your you know your power center so to speak and that you have that confidence but also you're kind of owning you know at the beginning I was talking about well, where the power is yeah you got your own power in in that scenario so um, I, I suggested it to a student once and she was shifting from hospitality to retail and I was just walking by and she's in the coffee shop she said oh back I'm going for a job I said you've got to do a power pose got this view a couple of days later she sent me a message she said Beth I did the power pose and I got the job so um and it's not woo woo because um uh well it might sound woo woo there is the science and I love to be able to bring woo woo and science together so please 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 when you get ready get that power pose happening um and also remember this may be really helpful my, my other final top top tip is remember that really, really successful people fail all the time. They fail on a much, much larger scale than the rest of us. So I, I, I'm not a huge fan of Nicole Kidman, but in fact, her and Kylie Minogue, I have huge admiration for because they put themselves out there in front of a million people. They do a bad movie, bad film, they sing or they dance, 
yeah, and they fail monumentally. And you know what? They just get back up again. They do it again. And then sometimes they do well. Whereas the rest of us, we operate on a much smaller scale and, you know, we think, oh, far out. So when you go into that interview, just think, oh, it's conversation. Um, and I've only, it's only a couple of people here. So if I, if I, if I bomb out, it's actually only a couple of people. I've actually done that language um, a number of years ago, went into the toilets, did the power pose, and I just went, oh, remember, got this. And I just remembered, you know, Nicole Kidman fails all the time. And that will, that will change that sense of like, oh, I've got to perform for a million people. It's a couple of people, goes wrong, bugger it, move on. Find a few more people to get up and then eventually you'll get there. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, any final questions? Um, I know I've got a couple of minutes over time. We're cruising into Stefan's time here. Oh, thanks, Leanne. Yes. Oh, so, so true. I agree 100%, Leanne. And I actually, the more I kind of study and learn in this area, I, I don't know that it's true in every case, but I do, I'm starting to think that you don't get the job there is a bigger picture and there's another reason and there's something else. And I've just kind of, you know, joined along, you know, with this colleague through this process and then seeing where she's ended up through this rather pa painful experience. But I see now that, you know, that she's ended up somewhere that is a much better fit. So I, I tend to agree 95% um, because well, it was meant to be, it was meant to be, as long as you put in your best work, you put in your best effort and then you let it go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, hi. I just want to add to that because, yeah, sometimes if you go in and you tell them who you are and what your expectations are and you don't fit the job, or maybe you just weren't the right fit for that business, for that um, workplace, for they have different, you know, ethics or whatever. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I think with, with expectations, we just have to be clear, like, because it's all about framing. Um, and in fact, I was just having this conversation with someone about this this morning, that the, the, this, the, 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 a minor change in wording can actually change how somebody receives information. So um, practicing with someone can really help you tweak because you're going to say the same thing, but say it slightly differently in that. Um, in that setting so I agree absolutely because you do have expectations um, and they have expectations of you and they call it the psychological contract and so when it's in harmony and balance you're both going to do really well so that's right if they if they're not going to meet your expectations um, then they're not the right um, fit for you you just need to be able to communicate your expectations in a way that's um that's received beautifully, you know, from the other one. So, oh, no worries, Katie. Um, I'm around running some one-on-ones. I'll send the email out if you, um, I've sent it out maybe this afternoon or early next week. So I've got some appointments at the end of next week for anybody that wants to just have a one hour powwow with me about anything, or you've got particular things you want to work on. I'll be back in, I think probably February and I'll run some more. So just know that, um, particularly for you guys that have come face-to-face -to, -face to the session, I'll prioritise you in terms of those time slots. All right. Any other questions? Thanks so much for coming along. You guys asked, um, oh, and now I've just told everybody at home, you guys are all a priority too. <laughs> um, of course, I'll make time as best I can. Um, we just don't have a ton of them, but the SCU careers team, Susie and the team, they're there all the time for you. So um, any other questions from um, anyone? All good. Jonas, you okay? All right, great. I might boot Leanne and Jonas out of the out of the session. I'm going to stop the recording because um, uh, Stefan and I are going to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so thank you so much. Lovely, lovely to. Oh, you do have a question? Yes, please tell me, Jonas. What's my cousin's name? Beautiful name. Oh, Jonas Sarah. <laughs> oh, you don't. Oh, okay, fine. No worries. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well done for you for coming along. All right. See you soon. I'm just going to stop the re recording.